Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have an early impression video on a long lost discontinued masculine scent that is actually a celebrity scent. And you guys know my taste. There's very few celebrity scents that I deem worthy of um, putting into the category of going and hunting down these discontinued, hard to find, you know, masculine fragrances from the past. But there are a few that I have mentioned on the channel, probably the most famous and the one that I think is the best suited to my taste is Luciano Pavarotti. I've talked a lot about this previously. And the newer one to my collection within the last, you know, three months or so that I've really enjoyed and that I, I think um, is very close to giving Pavarotti a run for its money as far as the best uh, celebrity scent is a fragrance called Jean-Louis Trintignant. And this is very hard to find, but, um, you know, these two I mentioned being sort of at the top of the celebrity fragrance mountain. And I still think the nod goes to Luciano Pavarotti, but uh, we're going to make it a little bit of a trio. And there may be one or two other celebrity scents I've talked about previously as well, but those are the two that just instantly popped in my head when I think about celebrity scents. This is another one. And it's from the house of Omar Sharif. And this is called Omar Sharif Pour Om. All right, so you can see the Pour Om right there. This is a 1992 release. And this, just to show you how times have changed, look on the bottom. It says that this is a gratuity. So it is not for sale. They used to give these 7.5 mil minis away as sort of free gifts to folks that made a purchase and they used to make the minis in the shape of the bottle none of this you know one mil two mil uh you know sample set some of them don't even have atomizers that they now sell for 60 80 100 dollars no none of that back in the day they used to give this to you uh as a way to test the fragrance before you had a chance to buy it and i will say it ah the good old days it's just the way that i feel uh, and you know what? The fragrance deserves to be in the trio of best celebrity scents. And let's talk a little bit about Omar Sharif first, because um, if you don't know, Omar Sharif is probably the most famous actor to come out of Egypt, uh, as far as like modern actors go. He uh, was originally born Michael Dimitri Shalhoub, uh, and some say it was Michelle, some say it was Chalhoub instead of Shalhoub, but Long story short is uh, he was born in uh, 1932 in Alexandria, Egypt to a prosperous lumber merchant. And uh, so when he was four years old, his family moved to Cairo, where he basically attended English schools and, and had a dream to become a famous actor. Uh, so he had big aspirations to become a famous actor. He went to secondary school, theater school, stuff like that. And when he first um, came of age, his father urged him to work in the family business, which he did. In 1953, he caught a big break. Starring next to Fatin Hamama uh, in Sira, um, The Struggle in the Valley from 1954. That was sort of his breakthrough role. And so his acting career, he became known, uh, eventually he ended up becoming known as Omar Sharif. And so he went on to star in many big films. Probably the two main ones that uh, most people recognize him for is Lawrence of Arabia from 19... Uh, when was Lawrence of Arabia? 1962, I believe. Uh, don't quote me on that. But uh, he won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor in Lawrence of Arabia. And then uh, in Dr. Uh, Zivago, I believe it was called, uh, in, in Dr. Zivago, he was basically awarded the uh, Academy Award for Best Actor. And those were sort of two of the highlights of his career. However, he was a very interesting man because... Uh, at some point, he ended up turning down a lot of roles later in life that he just called rubbish. He didn't think they were worth his time. Um, and uh, he was a big-time gambler. So he once claimed on Jay Leno that he won over a million dollars gambling at a casino in one night. Uh, he was also a huge bridge player. He was uh, one of the top-ranked bridge players in the world. Bridge is sort of a game that uh, uses the mind. And it's very sad that into his uh, later years and his downfall, what ended up uh, killing him was dementia. Dementia is a terrible disease. If you've ever known anyone with dementia, it's uh, very sad to see. You know, I, I often say that uh, you can live to be 100 
And, you know, I, I would take living uh, as long as the good Lord lets me, as long as I have my mind. The mind is the biggest thing. The body can ache, but uh, if you have your mind, you know, you can still sort of enjoy life. And, and losing your mind, I think, is one of the one of the worst things that can happen to a human being, especially someone as bright and brilliant as Omar Sharif. Um, and he was uh, very critical of himself. You know, one thing that I noticed, I watched some of his interviews for this video, um, and he was very critical of himself. He, he stated that uh, in movies like uh, Dr. Zivago, he thought that he was either too emotional in this scene or, you know, he'll watch the whole movie and he'll only find like 15 or 30 seconds where he is proud of the way he acted and he didn't like the rest of the movie or, you know, those kind. He was very, very critical of, of his acting and he always wanted to do better. Uh, very interesting character, I'll tell you that. And, and uh, being somebody who it's, it's now May the 21st of 2023, um, and being somebody who has basically boycotted Hollywood, my personal taste, I can't stand the, the absolute garbage that Hollywood is putting out. And I also can't stand how nowadays, uh, whatever you want to call the group of people controlling places like Hollywood, use it as almost a dumping ground for propaganda. I'm so sick and tired of that shit. Uh, I just basically completely tune out. I don't. Li I don't watch hardly any shows. I don't watch. I don't watch any movies. I can't tell you the last time I watched a movie. And I used to enjoy watching movies, and it's sad. So what I'm. I want to do is I want to go back and watch these old movies uh, that I haven't seen. I've never seen Doctor Zivago. I've never seen uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Um, those kind of movies from the past before uh, it felt like uh, Hollywood became basically a dumping ground for propaganda with whatever, you know, woke BS crap they're trying to push down our throats nowadays. So I just tune out. I don't I don't listen to any of that crap. Uh, but maybe going back in time and watching some of the old movies would be something that I would uh, definitely enjoy more than the modern uh, crap that they're putting out. So uh, enough about Omar Sharif, the person. Let's talk about Omar Sharif Pour Homme, the fragrance from 1992. So apparently uh, Omar Sharif as a house was around many years before this fragrance. So... Uh, for example, there was a perfume that came out in 1990 called Omar Sharif Pour Femme. That was the first one in 1990. And that's actually a fragrance that has been on my wish list because my good friend, uh, Russian Adam, told me about Omar Sharif Pour Femme. Uh, it's a Francois Caron creation, apparently. And he talked about how great that fragrance was for such a small amount of money that he paid for it. So I'm very interested in trying the Pour Femme. That was 1990. 1992... That's where you had Omar Sharif Pour Homme come out. And I think they even had one later in the decades of the 90s. They had um, a fragrance called Conviction for Women from 1998. And then Ignis in 1994, along with uh, Nubiad in 1994. So they had a couple releases. Uh, it was also Conviction for Men in 1999. That was the final uh, release from the house of Omar Sharif. But um, Omar Sharif Pour Homme, I've had a chance to wear it to bed once previously. And today I'm wearing it as my scent of the day, and I've had a chance to reapply. So it's been it's been on my skin now for about four and a half hours here, and I just did a fresh spray about half an hour ago. Mm, okay, so let's talk about the fragrance itself. So basically, um, what you what you get with Omar Sharif is upon first whiff, very first whiff, you're presented with a fragrance that feels like it has its feet and arms squarely in uh, multiple genres that span decades. Okay. So um, I think it's a very complex fragrance, and I think whoever created this had a deep understanding of fragrance trends from the past, okay? Because basically what you will get is you will get hints of these oriental vibes, okay? There are some oriental touches in this fragrance. Uh, for example, there's some amber and uh, leather in the base, um, and it has that sort of warm labdanum tonka bean feeling. However, uh, it never takes over the fragrance. That's something to make very clear. This is not a heavy oriental fragrance from the past. No, it's not It's not like JHL or opium or cinnabar. It's not like anything like that. It's not a big uh, old school oriental. It's not Shalimar. It's, it's, none, it's none of that, but it has touches of an oriental style, okay? It also has touches of a barbershop style, and we'll talk about sort of... Um, my theory on why there's this barbershop touch, even though the note 
uh, to truly make it a barbershop fragrance for men is not listed. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that here later on into the review. And uh, finally, you'll notice a couple other things. I mean, right from the beginning, this is first spray. The first 30 seconds to a minute is very complex and the fragrance goes in a lot of different directions. Uh, and one of those directions is an old school animalic vibe. And so even now, you know, 30 minutes after I've sprayed, I can still pick up some of that animalic bit uh, pushing through. And it's actually really well done. It's enough animalics where someone like me um, who loves old school animalic scents and, and the dirtier the better, this keeps my attention. There's this very leathery castorium. It almost feels like castorium and civet, although there's no civet note listed on Parfumo, only castorium. Um, but it, it does have that uh, sort of late 70s, early 80s animalic vibe to it, okay? And then finally, the very next thing your nose will pick up within 30 seconds or a minute of spraying. And as the minutes go by, uh, leading up, I would say, to the first half an hour or so, maybe even an hour, you're going to notice these beautiful, top-notch aldehydes, okay? Um, to me, the aldehydes instantly reminded me of one fragrance that came out just a couple years before this. And I've talked about it. It's a masculine fragrance. Um, and I only have this version. I don't have the true deep vintage. I would, I, well, that's not true. I do have a couple minis of the true deep vintage. So I'll do a comparison video one day. It's on the, it's on the never ending list of videos I want to do for you guys, but it's Lagerfeld's Photo. And so this is the Unilever Parfums, um, it's a Unilever distributor. You can see right there, Unilever. The older bottles, I think, are Parfums International, or I forget who made the, the true deeper vintage. The deeper vintage had this uh, sort of rubbery bit right here around the uh, cap, and it was in the old school writing. This is more of the modern Lagerfeld writing. If you've seen some of the old Lagerfeld bottles, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, but instantly, the way that the aldehydes mixed with the spices and the woods and stuff like that, the florals, I instantly got this Lagerfeld photo connotation. And this is probably, even though it's not a true one-for-one -one comparison, this is probably the fragrance that uh, Omar Sharif Porom most takes after, according to my nose. Okay, so I think uh, the... There are obviously many other touches, like I talked about. This is a very complex fragrance, but if you said, Ramsey, pick one fragrance that you think most influenced Omar Sharif Porom, and it would be this. And the timeline makes sense, because this came out in 1990. This came out in 1992. So it really does make sense that this was a big contributor to what we're smelling here. Um, and so one thing that I will say, and, and not to harp, not to harp on the, la on the um, aldehydes, but it's a big part of the fragrance. The aldehydes, to me, if I, when I close my eyes and smelled this, and I like to play this game, the first time I smell the fragrance, I like to sort of smell it, make some notes before I even look at a note listing. Just see what my brain sort of gives me. And instantly, the note that I made was, this feels like one of Bernard Schantz um, extremely complex old school Shepras with a big aldehydic top that sort of uh, blends into the mid. And, um, you know, if you've ever smelled some of those old school Bernard Chant uh, creations with the, with the aldehydes, um, for example, if you've ever smelled um, Aramis Aramis from 1964, if you've smelled um, Aramis 900, for example, uh, if you have smelled JHL, if you've smelled Devon, um, those are all sort of, um, those are the big Bernard Schott creations that, that just come to mind off the top of my head. Um, he, he did aldehydes in a way that, uh, really uh, very few people did. If you've smelled Estee Lauder's Azure, you'll have an, you'll have an idea of the, of the aldehyde construction that I'm, that I'm talking about. It's really special. It's a, uh, I've never seen a perfumer create an aldehyde accord so sort of unique, almost like a fingerprint of Bernard Shaw. It, uh, it's, it's one of the most amazing things about his creations to me. I think it's, uh, I think it's absolutely glorious. I think it's a triumph of, of perfumery. And that's actually what came to mind is this very aldehydic, um, sort of, uh, uh, creation blended with all of these other things that I mentioned. So a little barbershop-y, which, you know, if you know some of the, think of the 
oriental base fragrances that have this barbershop put uh you know a cord put on top like uh for example if you if you uh, if you know what i'm talking about things like Zeno or free life or even Guerlain's heritage which came out excuse me in the same year has this sort of vanillic um ambery base but with this barbershop sort of bit put on top and um it's a little bit of that but it doesn't smell so much like uh, Zeno or Free Life. Like if you smell Free Life by Etienne Eigner that came out one year after Zeno, you're like, man, this smells very, very close to Zeno. This doesn't smell like Zeno or Free Life or Heritage or Escada Por Homme or anything like that. It smells much closer to Photo, but it has that sort of barbershop feel uh, just implemented on top of, of a little bit of an oriental base. I don't know who the perfumer is, interestingly enough. There's no perfumer listed on either um, on either uh, base notes or on Parfumo. I did not check Fragrantica. Let's let's check the old evil Fragrantica, shall we? Uh, Omar Sharif Porom. Um, they do not list a perfumer, although the, the this perfume reminds me of Section in Fragrantica is pretty funny. Um, they, they, uh, they do list this, um, Salvador by Salvador Dali. I don't get the connection there. They list, uh, Roger and Galay's Loam, which I've never smelled. They list some other things I've never smelled. And finally, they list actually one other, which is an interesting, um, comparison. It also came out a couple years before Omar Sharif Porom, and it's this, Balenciaga Porom. And there, I could see, imagine sort of uh, a blend of these two. That's very, that's actually very fair. They don't list this though in um, Fragrantica. So some, you know, this is the first thing that popped in my head, but this comparison is sort of interesting uh, because, because of the way sort of the spices and everything blend, uh, it, it, it's not a true one-to-one -one comparison, but uh, Balenciaga Porom, it's a little bit of an interesting comparison with, um, with Omar Sharif Porom. So, uh, let's talk about some of the other aspects of the fragrance. So, um, it sort of makes sense, uh, like I said, the way that the aldehydes played together because of the fact that this was just a couple years before and um, probably the biggest inspiration, I think, for Omar Sharif Porom. And um, one thing that's very important to mention in the fragrance breakdown, and remember, I do not own a full bottle. I just have a mini. It's not like I've worn this for decades and I know it like the back of my hand. This is a newer fragrance to me. But uh, to my nose, the first thing that sort of pops in my head as the fragrance continues to develop is you get this um, sort of, you're presented with this very complex array of notes and styles. And um, I was thinking about Omar Sharif himself, the man, and how it may relate to the fragrance itself. And um, there's an interview of Omar Sharif where he's talking about his role in Dr. Zivago. And he says that uh, he didn't know when he was doing the acting, he didn't know what music, what score would be put with his acting style. And so sometimes it just didn't mesh perfectly. You know, there was a point in time where he was crying during scenes with his lover, and then they ended up putting this very romantic, you know, uh, uh, music to it. And it, he said it just didn't make sense. You know, he wouldn't have been crying like a little girl. He wouldn't have turned on the waterworks if he knew they were going to put on this sort of uh, romantic man woos woman uh, type of music to go along with it. He was crying like a little girl. And um, so there were just music, there was just moments where the music and the acting didn't mesh in his mind is something he said that's very interesting. And, and sometimes I feel that's true about this fragrance. Like I feel like it's going in a million different directions. There's so many um, little, you know, uh, references to here and there. And, and the perfumer um, is kind of doing this buckshot, scattershot approach, hoping to sort of hit on maybe something that's popular in 1992. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's almost like to me, I was thinking there's a spot in the USA where you can actually lay down and your arms and legs are in four different states at once. Okay, it's the only spot in America where you can be in four different states. And I think those four states are Arizona, Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico. 
if I'm not mistaken, but you can lay down there and you're in all four states at the same time, technically. Uh, and that's sort of how this fragrance goes. It just pulls in all directions, you know, like, um, like they tied your arms to one horse and they tied your legs to another horse and someone fired a gun and the horses take off, you know, that's the feeling, which that is an old torture technique too, by the way, but you're just being pulled, uh, in, in all directions with this fragrance. And, you know, part of me really likes it because you can see, um, how exciting this is for me. Well, first of all, the other thing I should mention before I get into the, the rest of the fragrance is that there are zero YouTube videos on this. I am shocked. Uh, I am dumbfounded by the fact that there are zero YouTube fragrance videos on this, and it shows just how much the people who follow the YouTube community are sheep, okay? They, they don't go in their own. They're not rams. They're sheep, and uh, they, they um, can't critically think for themselves and think outside of the box. If someone says something's good, they all run that way, you know? Sebastian said, Thomas DeMonico, gold is awesome. I'm going there. Uh, and, and, and even in the vintage community with folks like myself and, and many others, the fact that there are zero reviews of this is shocking, shocking. This is 1992. We're in 2023. How is it that, uh, it, oh, I, I do have to also say thank you to Armando for sending this to me because if it wasn't for Armando, I would not be doing this video. So there you have it. Um, Armando is inadvertently sort of uh, adding to the uh, vintage fragrance scene on YouTube by sending stuff like this to me. But it, it's 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 almost necessary. There's a hole, you know. There's a hole in the in the uh, uh, there's a hole in the force. There there it needs to be filled. I really feel like uh, it's a it's an absolute shame that stuff like this is not talked about more for vintage lovers, especially like ourselves. So once that all over the place sort of uh, dry down begins to settle. You're left with a very important note in the fragrance. I would almost say the capstone note in this fragrance is cypress. And cypress is a note that I absolutely adore. I love the note of cypress. I think it's extremely underrated uh, and underused in perfumery. And cypress basically uh, starts to really shine in this fragrance and it, it, it takes over the, uh, the leading role See what I did there? Uh, so Cypress for me always gives me this sort of healing quality. It, um, it, it has this herbaceous, woody, spicy, slightly evergreen-like feel that, um, um, like, like scent, if you will. And do you know, so here's how I was thinking about it. Do you know when you're near these type of trees, it doesn't have to be Cypress, it could be evergreen trees or coniferous firs or, you know, all these different types of trees that sort of give off this vibe, right? But um, let's say you're near these type of trees in a forest and it's cold outside. And when you breathe in, you get this sort of um, wintergreen, evergreen mintiness in the, in the back of your throat. And you get, it, you get this um, mixture almost of the aroma the trees are giving off and the cold. And that's the smell of cypress to me. Cypress is when the air is so cold you can like see your breath when you, when you breathe. And there is something almost cleansed or disinfectant about the world. Uh, now, obviously, you can cleanse by fire, uh, but you can also imagine this very sterile sort of frozen environment, right? Um, and that's the feeling that Cypress gives me. Now, even though I just mentioned a image of cold, this is not a cold weather scent. Uh, I mean, it could be a cold weather scent, but I also think it's a year-round scent. I think this could easily be worn any time of the year, just like I think Balenciaga Pour Homme is an all, an all year scent. And I think um, Photo is an all weather scent. Some people say these are winter scents. I disagree. I think these can be worn in the heat and they work beautifully for me in the heat. Um, I, uh, I even think that Photo is, uh, like I said, a year round perfume. And, and, and the reason I think that is because since I think uh, Photo is a year round perfume, I definitely think that Omar Sharif can be a year-round perfume because what happens with Photo, so Photo um, has a very interesting note. It has this uh, big sort of soapy aldehydic opening uh, and then it goes into this um, um, honeyed-like floral creation, okay, that uh, is missing from Omar Sharif Pour Homme. So, so one thing that you'll notice is there's no honey and Omar Sharif Pour Homme. And usually honey adds that level of sort of warm, warmth 
And uh, now, to be fair, this is a fresher take on honey. It's not like Boss Number no. One from five years earlier or anything like that. It's a much fresher take on honey, but still, honey is a very heavy, thick, resinous, syrupy like note that most people associate with winter. And so, if I can wear photo in the heat, you bet your bottom dollar I can wear Omar Sharif Pour Homme in the heat. Um, and um, so, so, here's what I would say. I would say after that cypress greenness that really starts to take over and, and, and you know, really grabs the, the leading role and, and doesn't let go for a long time, uh, what you end up getting, what you end up smelling is this beautiful floral heart, fantastically executed floral heart. I would love to know who the perfumer is. I'm wondering if it's Francois Caron because she did the Pour Femme. I, 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 would, I would love to know, but it's not listing her as the perfumer. So uh, it's a mystery. But um, this floral heart with rose and geranium, and you get this sort of juxtaposition of uh, florals with the aldehydes and the wood, the cypress, um, with this um, with this spicy accord, okay? And the spicy accord, also with the slight bit of animalics in the background. Now, the animalic is castorium. It's listed in the base, according to Parfumo. But for me, the animalics come out even more in the opening. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on as well. But, um, you know, slightly peeking through from the base, you get this animalic bit. And this is where the fragrance stays for a long while. It sort of stays in this range after the first half an hour or an hour. And, and it, it levels off, let's say, the horses that all pull in different directions stop pulling. And you're left with this... Um, fragrance where you'll notice a couple things in the heart of this fragrance. So, uh, number one, there is no doubt in my mind that this fragrance has a lavender note in it. It's not listed, but I get a big herbal sort of medicinal balsamic lavender-like undertone to this fragrance. I think that's how they created the barbershop type vibe. And uh, if you look at photos, Note Tree, to me, I always thought lavender played a huge role in this. So instantly when I smelled Omar Sharif Pour Homme uh, and I was making my notes, I assumed there was lavender in there. It was just a pure assumption that uh, there was lavender in Omar Sharif Pour Homme. And then when I looked at the note listing, it is, um, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a huge hole missing. It's one of the biggest holes that is not uh, recognized according to the note breakdown. And I was shocked there's no lavender. Shocked. Uh, because how else do you create this accord? I mean... I think that's the hidden secret of Omar Sharif Pour Homme, is there is a lavender note that is uh, not recognized, number one. Uh, number two, the geranium note in this fragrance is a spot-on banger geranium note. Uh, and obviously there's some other things that are, are blending with the geranium in the floral heart, like some jasmine, some rose, and maybe most importantly, some old school carnation. Uh, but the geranium note in this is spot-on green, spicy, slightly soapy. Um, I think the soapy accord in Photo comes from different sources as the soapy accord in Omar Sharif Pour Homme. I think the geranium adds a little bit of the soapiness to Omar Sharif Pour Homme, whereas with um, Photo, um, there there is no geranium uh, listed for Photo. And so I think just the way that the aldehydes blending with the lavender and the top sort of give it this... Um, this soapy sort of aldehydic opening. So I think they kind of go about it in different ways, but I think they get to the same point, if you will. They arrive at a similar point in time, um, and it's beautiful. Yes, some people say it's old school in construction. Um, there's not many comments on it. There's no comments on Parfumo. There's just a handful of comments on base notes, and I think there's like one comment on... Uh, on Fragrantica that the guy says, wear it by yourself, no one will appreciate this type of smell. Well, F you, dude. Um, and, and so, and, he, and his, uh, it's funny because the guy who said that comment has his scent of the day as clubbed in a wheat man intense, intense man or whatever it is. So yeah, you smell great wearing an Armoff, dude. Um, so um, it also dries down to this leather type of sheep vibe. Remember in the beginning, I, I had mentioned that... Um, I had mentioned that it smells like an old school aldehydic Bernard Chant sort of chipre, right? And it dries down to this uh, sort of vetiver, leather, very masculine chipre um, like smell, if you will. But 
What I will say is there was a commenter on Base Notes that said he wished sort of the base notes in this fragrance were more amped up, and I think he's spot on. Um, I don't know if I would have thought about saying it that way if I didn't read that comment, but I think it's a good way to put it because the base notes in this fragrance, as it dries, I wish that they came out to play more. Like, I wish that Castorium was amped up more and the leather was amped up more. This would be one of the great... This could overtake Pavarotti, honestly, if if the base was just a little bit more finely tuned, you know? A little more of that leather, a little more of the heavier resinous labdanum sort of uh, taking over. God, a little bit of the way the labdanum is done in Le Leon here, or Sahara Noir, and you would just have a drool-worthy fragrance. Even without that, it's still, still... Uh, one of my favorite um, uh, celebrity scents, if you will. I am absolutely shocked that uh, no one has done a video on this. Uh, but I would say to the victor go the spoils. And I'm glad that I was the one to bring this to FragCom, if you will. I feel like, um, and I know this video, go go, go, go back if you're bored in, in a week or two and look at the views on this video and look at the views on like my list. And you'll see this will have like, 500 views less than uh, whatever the list was because people have sort of uh, lost interest in the art of a true individual fragrance review, talking about one fragrance that they don't have or they've never smelled or something like that. I think true frag heads want to learn about stuff, even if you've never smelled it. Uh, it's I, I watch stuff on, on fragrances I've never smelled before all the time. I was just, I got done watching Mark's uh, from the Robes 08 channel review of some shite Zerzhoff I've never smelled and, and don't plan on smelling, uh, but I was just interested in hearing what he has to say because I because I love his work. Um, and there's just, I think there's just a little bit of a lost art of the individual review. So that is sort of my overview. I think I uh, hit all points uh, on Omar Sharif Porom. I hope you guys have appreciated the video. If anyone out there has smelled Omar Sharif Porom, I would love to know your your thoughts your comments. It looks like he's sort of wearing a necklace, you know, or maybe a unbuttoned uh, shirt. Um, so if anyone smelled this, I would love to hear your thoughts. Do um, leave a comment. I love seeing your faces in the comments. Uh, I, I very much appreciate the support everyone has given me for this type of content. This is important stuff to me, and I hope that uh, I hope that you guys think I did this video justice. So uh, I'm not going to say. Uh, what I was saying previously, I'm going to stop saying like and subscribe and all that shit. I'm going to try to stop saying it because I, I don't think you guys need to be told that. I think it uh, comes naturally if you find a channel that you like. You know how to like a damn video and subscribe, but it does help the stupid algorithm. Um, and, and I want more people who are into this stuff to find my channel. Slowly but surely, it's happening, but I want more. Uh, I want I want more growth because I know they're out there and I know they're, they're watching... Um, or there's a lack of, of this type of YouTube fragrance out there. And so I know there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of people who are kind of yearning, desperate for this type of content. So I hope uh, this video is well received. I, hope, I can't wait to read your comments. Cheers, guys, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.